Thank you very much. It's a great uh, pleasure and honor for me to be here and talk about a neurological injury following TAVI. So what I'm going to talk about is the incidence and impact of neurological injury. Then I'm going to touch upon the potential mechanisms. And in the last few minutes, I'll talk about cerebral protection and what can we do to prevent stroke. I'd like to start by listing three of the most important facts about TAVI. TAVI is superior to medical therapy in inoperable patients according to partner trial cohort B, which compared TAVI with medical treatment. And I think it's important to stress that 80% of the medically treated people also underwent balloon valvuloplasty. There was a remarkable difference in the mortality endpoint at one year, 50.7% versus 307 in the TAVI group. So there was a 20% difference at one year. This has been a landmark trial establishing TAVI as a treatment of choice in patients who deemed not suitable to have surgical AVR. The other part of this trial, cohort A, showed that TAVI is non-inferior to AVR in high-risk patients. There was no difference at one-year mortality, and of course the benefit is that TAVI is a less invasive treatment. However, neurological complications remain a special concern of this breakthrough technology. So starting with the partner cohort B, the, in the inoperable patients, uh, it seems that the price of TAVI is a stroke. Uh, we clearly see that the rate of major stroke was 5 at 30 days and 7.8 at one year. We also see that the rate of all stroke or TIA was significantly uh, different between the two groups at 30 day and at one year. This may not be a major problem in the inoperable patients, as they would have otherwise, if they don't have TAVI, they would have a very poor outcome. But we see the same picture when we look at cohort A patients, and these patients who are suitable for both treatment, TAVI, and AVR. Again, the rate of all neurological events was statistically significant between the two groups at 30 day and at one year. And here we are facing with a dilemma of balancing the benefits of avoiding open heart surgery and cardiopulmonary bypass and the increased risk of stroke with the TAVI procedure. When we look at the timings of when these neurological events happen, we basically see that the neurological injury with TAVI doesn't only occur very procedurally, but also at follow-up. If we just look at the rate of major strokes, we see that we had seven major strokes in the first 48 hours of the procedure, and then another seven or eight between 30 days at one year. So clearly the neurological injury related to TAVI has an early phase and a late phase. If we have a closer look at the data analysis and try to find out what were the risk factors for these events, these risk factors included the TAVI procedure itself, and a smaller aortic valve area index for those in the TAVI arm, and that's in the early phase. In other words, the tighter the valve, the more calcium in the valve, the higher the chance that you will have a stroke if you are in the TAVI arm. The risk factors in the late phase included higher New York Heart Association classification, history of a previous stroke, and non-transfemoral access. And this last one was quite surprising, as the initial thought was that there will be neurological protective benefit with a trans approach compared with a transfemoral approach, which was not found. This is highlights that there's an interaction not only between the two procedures, but also the kind of patients that we are treating. So if you have a patient who is not suitable to have transfemoral TAVI, but to choose to do surgical aortic valve replacement, you will still have a higher risk of a stroke in such patients. I'm afraid to say that the results of partner trial on the neurological injury might only be the tip of the iceberg. As a, as a German a group with a rather small study shed the first light on the silent neurological injury following TAVI. They found that 84% of their TAVI patients developed clinically silent new cerebral MRI lesions following the procedure. There was no difference between the two devices and no difference in the route of access. There was no associated neurological events or neurocognitive dysfunction. 
Their findings were also observed by further few small studies on the MRI, diffusion-weighted MRI. The rate of the silent lesions ranged between 60 and 84 percent. The stroke rate remained the same, approximately 5, and again, no, no neurocognitive dysfunction. And the big question is, what is the clinical significance of these MRI lesions? Are we satisfied that there's no long-term clinical significance with them? Is it just the neurocognitive assessment that have been used may have been not sensitive enough to pick them up? I think subclinical brain injury will be increasingly important when we move to treat younger patients. Any neuropsychological decline is often a lesser long-term concern in the current TAVI patients with mean age of 84. This will be of a great concern for younger patients. So we need to lower the risk of neurological injury, and to achieve that is vitally important to understand the potential mechanisms. In the early phase, we have the cerebral embolization, hypoperfusion, balloon valvuloplasty, and catheter thrombosis. In the late phase, we have thromboembolism. So I'm just showing this animation to highlight the various steps of the procedure where the potential embolization might occur. Embolization of the aortic atheroma during device passage, embolization of the calcified valve during crossing, balloon valvuloplasty, valve positioning and deployment, especially in difficult cases with extensive manipulation. Do we know the main source of cerebral impoli between these steps? Well, Philip Kahlert and his colleagues looked at this, trying to answer this question. They did a transcranial Doppler study on their TAVI patients, and they observed that TCD hits in almost all the patients, mainly during positioning and implantation. It's quite interesting to note that balloon valvuloplasty was associated with very few hits, probably secondary to the protective role of endothelium covering the calcium deposits in the aortic valve cusp. The other interesting thing about this study was during positioning, the core valve was associated with very few hits, probably secondary to the rather, to the rather rapidly positioning compared with the Edwards sapien processes. During implantation, it's the other way around. It's the core valve which was associated with high number of hits reflecting maybe the slow deployment of the core valve. The other potential mechanism is the cerebral hypoperfusion, and mainly in patients with carotid disease. And this is mainly due to rabbit basing, which is done during the valvuloplasty and valve deployment. This small study looked at cerebral saturation during TAVI using cerebral oximetry, and they observed that cerebral saturation reacts promptly to functional circulatory arrest during rabbit basing, but recovers very fast after termination. And there were no neurological complications with that. Balloon valvuloplasty is a very important potential mechanism and incidence during the TAVI procedure because it involves the previous two mechanisms. There will be rabbit basing and potential cerebral desaturation, and the, when the balloon extends, it pushes the calcium away and causing potential impoli. In the literature, stroke rates following balloon valvuloplasty in elderly patients with aortic stenosis ranges between 1 and 8 percent. Catheter thrombosis, mainly in long periods of valve positioning and deployment in difficult cases. Procedure anticoagulation is a key factor, and there's a fine balance between the stroke risk and the vascular complications from closure device failure. What is generally suggested is activating clotting time of greater than 250. What about late stroke, where long-term thromboembolic risk is currently unknown? Atrial fibrillation, seems, for, atrial fibrillation following TAVI seems to play an important role. Potentially, it's an important mechanism that might explain some of the late strokes. In this recent Canadian study looking at 138 patients, the incidence of new onset atrial fibrillation was almost 32%, and these people had a higher rate of stroke. It's unclear whether they are device-related, 
And if they are, perhaps there will be definitely a role for the anticoagulation and the antiplatelet therapy. So we need to improve the neurological outcome for our TAVI patients. So what can we do for cerebral protection and how we can prevent stroke? Of course, the newer generation of devices is much smaller. The sterility of the catheter is much better. Techniques have much improved, and this should help to reduce the risk of stroke. The other potential solution is the cerebral protection device. Three currently available, and I'll just concentrate on the one in the middle, the umbrella embolic defluctor, and there's some clinical data with it. The device consists of a porous membrane, nitinol frame, and shaft, and there are two radio opaque markers indicate the end of edge pattern and radio opaque ad marker at the uh, top of the shaft to help with the proper alignment of the device with tip of the sheath. A group and his colleagues, sorry, Ganem and his colleagues prescribed the first human experience with these devices with a right radial artery axis, the correct placement is usually achieved without any difficulty. The idea is to cover the ostia of the brachiocephalic trunk and the left carotid. The additional time to the procedure was about 13 minutes and there were no complications associated with these devices. Basically, it deflects the calcium away from the cerebral circulation and the deflecting petals consist of a heparin coated membrane. The early clinical experience showed that there was a decrease in the number of MRI lesions, 11-fold decrease in MRI lesion volume, and 55 decrease in the TCD hits. However, I have to say that we need to remember that the cerebral protection devices might only deal with about 40% of the neurological injury related to TAVI, and this is the intra-procedural neurological injury secondary to cerebral embolization. The other thing is that implanting the devices carries a certain risk as well because the implantation will be in the aortic arch where there will be some calcium, and when you deploy the device, there will be stresses which might cause cerebral embolization as well. The other potential solution came from Professor Group, who asked a very interesting question. Can we do TAVI without balloon valvuloplasty? Is it feasible? Does it reduce the risk of stroke? Thirteen international centers participated in this study, and they had a high success rate in 60 patients. Two messages from this study. Stroke rate remained the same, 5%. Post-dilatation was required in 16 percent of their patients, which might counteract with the potential beneficial effect of omitting valvuloplasty in the first place. Anticoagulation following the procedure is quite a tricky area because there's no evidence yet. Whether you use single or dual antiplatelet therapy, how much clobidogrel you give, and when and for how long, what about if the patient develops new onset AF, or have a coexisting coronary disease, or had a recent stent, whether bare metal or drug eluting? Do you add warfarin on the top of aspirin and clopidogrel and putting these high-risk patients at even very high risk of bleeding? Large trials need to be conducted in the future to determine the optimum anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy following TAVI. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, neurological injury is one of the biggest challenges of TAVI. Early neurological injury is most likely related to embolization. Future trials need to determine the efficacy of the cerebral protection devices. Late injury needs to be differentiated from the early injury as it has most likely completely different itology. And large trials again needs to answer the big question of the ideal anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy. Potential neurocognitive dysfunction needs more evaluation. Just in the last two slides, I'll just highlight two current very important studies. Protect Me study by um, Philip Kahlert's group, and uh, this is a randomized control trial looking at the cerebral protection devices and the antithrombotic treatment. NeuroTavi 
uh, trial, which is a study we're doing at St. George's at Royal, and, and Royal Brompton Hospital in London, and we're looking at the incidence and mechanisms of neurocognitive dysfunction following TAVI compared to high-risk AVR. And we are using neuroimaging, transcranial Doppler, cerebral oximetry, and very detailed neurocognitive assessments. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Eamon. Thanks for sticking to time. Any questions? Michael. Yeah, sure. The neurocognitive assessment is really difficult. Um, I did my PhD actually in that area about 12 years ago, and I can tell you, it's a hornet's nest. I wouldn't get into there if I were you, because the it, because the problem is the, the the tests weren't made, they weren't developed to be administered to the same person now and three months from now. Although they do that now with athletes, and. When you, the, you know, when this whole story took off 20 years ago that cardiac surgery and cardiopulmonary bypass is bad for the brain, and we went every year, we went to uh, Key West and we met with the same people every year and we talked about the same data, and then finally people from uh, John Hopkins came one year and they showed and they said, actually, if you do neurocognitive testing with a control group, so patients before and after surgery, but also similar coronary artery disease patients that did not have surgery, there's no difference. So I really would caution against neurocognitive outcomes. They're really difficult to interpret. I mean, the uh, first thing, the current uh, trials actually, and the neurocognitive assessment that they've been used were quite basic. I mean, they've used mini-mental state examination, uh, NIHR assessment, which they're not the best to detect the subclinical brain injury, which I think is really important when we move to treat younger patients. It might, I mean, it doesn't matter. Maybe it might not matter with 85 years old uh, gentlemen, but with like 65 or 70 years old patients, it will be of a great concern. And the other patient, I'm not sure what you say about these silent lesions. Eight, I mean, in one study, 84% of the patients, almost everyone who's got DAVI will have cerebral lesions. Um, silent lesions, I mean, are we satisfied they are silent without any long-term clinical significance with them? I'm not sure what's your experience on this. Total, we can all agree, if, I, you know, if you can choose between 100 milliliters of infarct in your brain and 10 milliliters, you're going to choose 10. So I would go with that, even though we don't know exactly what that, it, it, clinically how that translates into, but at least it's something that you can accurately measure. Yeah. Neil, a question from Neil. Uh, but just a, a comment a couple of questions. The, the data you showed um, from Philip Carlett about the core valve time of embolization, yeah that it, it, you would not expect with that the Gruber strategy of avoiding valve to have any effect. So I think it's, it's interesting comparable bits of data that uh, it would appear that it's actually the core valve deployment that's the, the period of risk. The, the, the thing that worries me about stroke in TAVI is the data from partners showing that half of the major strokes occurred between three and 10 days uh, after the implant. And whilst we can get very clever with cerebral uh, embolic protection devices, they're clearly not going to be effective in that population. Um, you, you touched on the fact that we don't know what to do. Clearly, we need to look at antiplatelet and anticoagulant strategy during that period. And my, my theory is we're just leaving a whole load of crushed, denuded calcium in the aortic sinuses, which is a perfect milieu for forming platelet aggregates and clot. So what, what do you think we should do? How do you think we should manage these patients between day two and day 10? where they're at high risk of stroke? Um, I mean, as I say, because there's no uh, evidence yet, it's quite a difficult area to comment on. At St. George's, we used well antiplatelet therapy for three months, followed by um, aspirin lifelong. For patients who uh, develop a new onset of AF, we add warfarin and maybe omit one of the antiplatelet therapy. So it's a quite, I mean, it's quite a difficult area. I know, I mean, in other places they use um, just aspirin or just clopidogrel. So maybe we will be waiting for randomized trials to answer this uh, question about the ideal anticoagulation antiplatelet therapy. I suppose the question is, should all of our patients be on therapeutic So dual antiplatelet, the downside of that, of course, would be what are their, what's their rate of anticoagulant of, of hemorrhagic stroke. But it's certainly an area I think we need to think about. Uh, I think it's also difficult. We, we don't know what 
what's going on. And we, we, unfortunately, we don't have TCD as like a telemetry, so we can watch the hits every day, every hour, you know, and that, that would be the way to know if we're just leaving this calcium and it's just slowly flying off, or little nidoses of, and, and, you know, clots just flying off, and we don't know the timing of that, really. Absolutely. So, 